Oh, Heavenly Father, I thank you for how sure our salvation is. God, I thank you for Jesus Christ and what a rock he is for us. God, this world is a shifting place with many things that are uncertain. Oh God, I know in my own heart the, the fears that can rise up when I think that hope depends on something in this world. But God, I thank you that it doesn't. I thank you that we know in your word how sure salvation really is because it was purchased for us at the cross. And I thank you that as uh, the body of Christ this morning here at Grace Bible Church, we are able to now meet together and take communion together to remember once again the surety of our salvation, the foundation on which we stand. And it's not us. It has nothing to do with us, God. You know our sins are many. You know our weaknesses. You know our need for forgiveness. And you have provided it through your son. And so we thank you. God, may you get all the glory as we remember this great truth together. I pray. Amen. So as we come to share some bread and juice in the memory of our Lord's death this morning, please open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter uh, and if you do not have a Bible this morning, uh, some men will come forward and they'll get these Bibles. Do we have some? Yes. All right. Uh, you can just raise your hand if you don't have a Bible and they will make sure you get one. Uh, if you do not own a Bible, if you don't have a Bible to read, this, this Bible is our gift to you. Open to Ephesians chapter 2. Each week at Grace Bible Church, we take time to remember the most important historical event in the history of the world. And I actually took time this week to Google and see what Google thought was the most important historical event in the world. And I got all kinds of answers. Uh, some of it had to do with the birth of certain politicians who made a difference in the world. Some of it had to do with the ending of great world wars. And I thought about it. I thought, you know, the what you define is the most important historical event has a lot to do with what you think man's greatest problem is. If it is war, then yes, the ending of a war would be an important historical event. But of course, we read our Bibles, and we know that the most important historical event in the history of the world was the execution of Jesus of Nazareth. And today we get to remember that. Uh, in Ephesians 2... 11 to 16, we, we get a reminder from the pen of Paul. And Paul charges his readers. This is the first command in Ephesians. Paul charges his readers not to forget, but to remember that we were all once far off from the help and the peace that we so desperately needed with God. Read along as I read Ephesians 2. We'll start by reading verses 11 and 12. Therefore, remember that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So there's the problem. The problem that Paul outlines here requires that one understand some key moments throughout world history. To understand what the problem that Paul is writing about, you have to understand the history of the world. In the beginning, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. At the very start of world history, God was there. Everything else came to existence from God. The only one not created was the creator himself. And then just two chapters later in Genesis 3, the first two human beings rebel against God. They disobey a clear command. God told Adam quite clearly, eat all the fruit you want, just not from this one tree. If you do, you will surely die. So simple, so clear, yet all it takes is a crafty serpent to say you surely won't die, and the two of them eat in defiance of their creator. They are guilty. In the end of chapter 3, details God's condemnation of all three, the serpent, Eve, and Adam. Right at the beginning of, the, of world history, we see that there is conflict with God. Distance from the only lasting source of life and hope. 
mankind is in trouble with their creator. And this is a dreadful predicament to realize that you are in trouble with your creator. I mean, what can you give to God that he has not already given to you? How can you repay him? You can't. The serpent had nothing. Adam and Eve had nothing. They just have whatever sentence God deals to them. And you have a cursed serpent, a cursed ground, lots of pain, sweat, and tears for Adam and Eve. But then God promises the serpent something incredible. There will be a descendant, a son, born of the woman, who will come face the serpent's deadly poison and deal a fatal blow to that snake. Genesis 3.15 says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. For the serpent, this means eternal ruin. No hope for him. But for Adam and Eve and their offspring, this is a signal of hope. Then Genesis continues, and world history is really bleak. Mankind rebels. Evil grows rampant. God destroys all of mankind as punishment, except for Noah in a flood. Doesn't take long after that. A few hundred years as the world's repopulating, man once again groups together in rebellion against God. They rebel at the Tower of Babel, and God changes their languages, disperses them across the face of the globe, and creates all the nations that we see today. And then in Genesis 12, God picks just one man, Abram makes promises to him and his descendants, and God sets them apart from the rest of the world. And he gives them special covenants, special agreements that pertain to this great promise. He will be their God. They will be his people. To mark this covenant, God tells Abraham that every male must be circumcised in Genesis 17. The promised descendant of Eve will come through Adam's family. If the rest of the nations, those that are not set apart, if they want any part With this God, they must find their way to Israel's land, Israel's temple, Israel's God. Israel's set apart, and the nations are a long way off. So that's the issue that Paul presents here in Ephesians 2. That's that's our trouble. Most of us here are part of the nations. We're Gentiles. We're outsiders. And the descendants of Adam, with their sign of circumcision, see us that way as outsiders. They have names for themselves. They call themselves the circumcision. They have names for the rest of the world, the uncircumcised. That's a massive divide. A divide based on family ties, a divide based on customs and practices, a divide that's geographical. But even that divide is a superficial one compared to the real problem. The first, that first divide that you see in verse 11, that's one that's just marked into the human flesh by human hands. The second divide that we see in 12 goes much deeper. We need to remember, we need to not forget that we were separated from the Messiah, the rescuer, the promised one. No promise of the Messiah came to us. We need to remember that we were not citizens of Israel. Therefore, the agreements of the promise were not made to us. And last, we need to remember this final word in our diagnosis, which is this. We were without hope and without God in the world. World history could not leave us with a more dreadful diagnosis. It shows us our real problem, and it should leave us trembling before God Almighty. So what hope is there? The reality is there is not a single hope that we could purchase with our wealth. There's not a single hope we could vote into office. There's not a single hope we could earn with our good works or claim on the basis of some ancestry. So what hope is there? Let's keep reading. Ephesians 2, starting in verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. He did this by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two and thus making peace. And he might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. Jesus' death solves every 
problem that is set up in world history. The great divide that God set up when he set one family apart and made special agreements, covenants with them. The massive language and cultural barriers that we see today created by God at the Tower of Babel. And ultimately, the problem of spiritual death that started with Adam and Eve in the garden. Jesus is the peace that we need. He's the peace that we all need, Jew and Gentile. The Israelites wanted to be right before God by following God's law, and they couldn't. Their Messiah, the promised helper, they rejected. Their circumcision was only skin deep. Meanwhile, the rest of the nations were outsiders, were excluded from all the agreements made to Israel. And the blood of Jesus Christ takes both those groups, makes them one, and then reconciles both of them to God. Gives us the peace that we need. He did this by killing that hostility through the cross. Jesus took the punishment we deserved. Jesus was cut off. Jesus was punished. Jesus was rejected and treated as an enemy of God so that we, Jew or Gentile, don't have to be. Friends, if you are trying this morning to find peace with God any other way besides Jesus' death on the cross, then let me give you two things to do. First, when the bread and juice come by, just pass it along. The practice of remembering together, this practice of communion, doesn't save anybody. Only the blood of Jesus does that. So realize that until you come to Jesus for rescue and peace, you are still without hope and without God in this world. And that is a dangerous place to be in. And so secondly, talk to someone before you leave. There are many, many people in here who know the good news of Jesus. Uh, Come, come and talk to someone. There will be someone at the door here after the service. Come and hear this good news. If, If Jesus' death is your only hope for peace with God, if you are trusting in this hope, then join your church family in remembering the unity that we have with one another in Christ, and remember that we have peace with the creator of the universe through the blood of his son. So men, would you come and serve us this morning? And when your heart is prepared, you can take the elements on your own, and then Pastor John will come up and pray for us.